Um, good afternoon. Welcome everybody to this week's uh, data talk session. My name is Daphne van Hesteren and I will be your host today. Uh, currently I am part of the team that supports the European Commission in two of their initiatives. Uh, first, the European Data Portal, which promotes open data across all member states. And secondly, the Support Center for Data Sharing, which in addition focused on data sharing and opening up data to others. Um, in order to uh, always learn more about these topics and to gain uh, insights from different perspectives, we created these data talk sessions where we try to open an informal discussion with other people who are also uh, passionate, uh, passionate about these topics and to see what their view is on the matter. And for this week, the topic will be data sharing and the healthcare sector. The guest of this week is Ismail Ismail who wrote a really interesting opinion piece about data sharing in the healthcare systems. And uh, this can be found online on the website of the Support Center for Data Sharing. Uh, in case you did not find the chance to read this article, no worries, we will get through it uh, during the next half hour. But before we do, uh, a big thank you to Ismail that you found the time to join us today. And um, maybe you can briefly introduce yourself and explain to us why you are interested in data sharing and the healthcare sector. Yeah, definitely. First, uh, first off, thank for having me, uh, Daphna. Um, yeah, and thank you for the introduction. So I'm Ismail Ismail. I'm a management consultant at Capgemini Event uh, with a background in health economics, health policy, and data science. Um, as part of the business data strategy team within Event, I advise clients in both uh, public and corporate sectors and how to leverage data. Um, my interest for the topic primarily comes from my background in health economics uh, and the uh, intersection with data and data science, which you can get from data. Um, so data sharing comes for me extremely important because we often speak of leveraging data, but not always take the time to think about making data available for it to be leveraged. Um, and I think that that's an area of improvement. Thanks. Um, as I already mentioned, we will discuss your article during this session. And um, so that's also where I want to start our discussion for today. Um, in your article, you mentioned that in line with the strategy of the European Commission, uh, you think that better use of data could improve health and well being in our continent. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think data sharing is so important for our continent's healthcare systems? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's not even just about improving the well-being and health of uh, European citizens. It's also about sustaining. So sustaining the accessibility and quality of healthcare as it is while managing expenditure in the coming years is one of the wicked problems that we have in this generation and probably in the coming generations as well. Um, looking at the European continent, most countries have aging demographics, which are bound with an increase in healthcare demands, utilization and expenditure, of course. Um, and for us to manage this, or maybe even solve this challenge, we have to stay creative, inventive, and use all instruments we have at our disposal to the maximum. Um, data is one of those key instruments, I think. And I think so because it can provide us with insight on the bottlenecks within healthcare systems and improve healthcare research and treatment effectivity. And maybe in doing so, ultimately help the lives of millions of European citizens. Um, however, like I just said, while we often speak of treasures of big data and healthcare that need to be leveraged, these treasures can only be leveraged once the data becomes available. Um, and therefore, data sharing, in my opinion, is one of the crucial enabling factors we should focus on in the coming years. Thanks. Um, in order to do so, you mentioned in your article a strategy, and I need to say this correctly, the Health System Performance Assessment Framework, the HSPA framework. Um, and you say that this is a guide through creating value from data sharing. Could you maybe explain to us what you mean, wh how this framework, what it looks like, what it's about, and why you think it's so important? Yeah, definitely. So uh, Health Systems Performance Assessment, or uh, HSPA, it's, uh, it's my fault. Um, it's a framework that is uh, often used within health economics and health policy to assess the performance of the healthcare system. Um, even though health systems across the globe vary in their funding and structure, they often still have similar goals. So it's mostly generally about things like quality of health, accessibility, affordability. Um, and these goals clearly extend beyond just patient health. 
So HSPA provides the framework to consider the performance of a health system in its entirety and also contemplate healthcare outcomes beyond health itself. Um, and yeah, I can, I, I can go deeper into the dimensions of HSPA if, if that's what you want. Um, yeah. Should I do that? Okay. So um, the general consensus, like even though there are a couple of HSPA frameworks, the general consensus is that any HSPA framework should reflect at least the following goals. Uh, one being the improvement of health, uh, including the average level of health within a society, but also the equity within health. So it's also about those who need health. They should have access to healthcare and actually get the healthcare. Um, second, it's about responsiveness to citizens' preferences. So it's also about patients being able to make decisions and the general satisfaction uh, level of these decisions. Um, then you have the financial risk protection and accessibility offered. Um, and this is about protecting patients from financial hardships as a result of utilizing healthcare. So if I need healthcare and I use it, there should be no uh, long-term financial consequences for me to use it. And lastly, you have the productivity and efficiency, and that ties in with affordability. So what's the value for money that I get from my healthcare system? Um, and those are actually the four dimensions. So the first one clearly is about patient health, and it's really about the medical side. But at least three of the four of these dimensions are about things that extend, that extend way beyond healthcare outcomes themselves. So when looking at the value of data sharing, um, I wanted to have an outlook that is beyond what's obvious, and that's patient health. I want to have an outlook on a broader societal outcome level. So I want to look also at the other uh, dimensions. And I think HBA, HSPA is a good starting point to actually start mapping all the benefits that data sharing could bring to a healthcare system as a whole. Yeah, because you mentioned that, uh, especially for patients, it could be very beneficial if there's more information available. Do you think also other parties and institutions could benefit from more data sharing and more opening up the data? Um, so whether uh, it's, whether other actors besides patients would benefit from data sharing. I think that's the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. So like I said, I think the, the benefits of data sharing could extend way beyond just uh, the patient who is direct in contact with the healthcare system. I think if you're able to improve the effectivity, for example, of a healthcare system through the sharing of data, um, then that's something that would benefit society as a whole. That's something that you would... Uh, even if you don't use healthcare, you could benefit from, uh, for example, in, uh, in the premium that you pay for health insurance. That's something that could be sustained or even kept uh, at a lower level if our healthcare system is a bit more effective. Yeah. Um, so that's maybe an example, yeah. Okay. Um, I see that someone has a question. Um, Malgo, I hope I say it correctly. Um, sure, you can ask a question. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question about the security of the data because, I mean, um, it, it's clear that there are benefits and uh, this, is, uh, this is important for, for, for many reasons, but we are clearly not ready to have this data secured. Um, and uh, this is not a problem that will go away in the foreseeable future. So, um, like, how are we going to tackle this issue? now yeah that's a difficult one i think uh um yeah on the, on the case that we're maybe not ready yet to share such personal data i think i do agree with that um and how to, how to solve that 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 would take like some thorough exploration uh, because it's not something that will be solved on a european level like directly but it's something that you could explore on a more micro level first so maybe uh, within an institution itself by sharing the data then later on, maybe between institutions, and then try to make steps to a greater uh, scope. But thinking about sharing data on a European level now already, I don't think that's something that's possible uh, in the foreseeable future. However, there are some initiatives to actually facilitate the sharing of uh, patient data. Um, I think you have the, um, for example, the exchange of electronic health records across the EU, which seeks to facilitate the cross-border functionality of electronic health records by supporting member states in their efforts to ensure that citizens can securely access and exchange their data. So there are some initiatives, but how to actually make it so secure that it's something that we can deploy 
uh, in the coming years? That's a big question, definitely. Yeah, thank you for the answer. I mean, because I, if, if, if it would be my choice, I wouldn't share my data, knowing a little bit about the security. Like, no way. No. And uh, why is that? You um, because you simply, uh, you simply, I, uh, I don't think that the uh, technology, technology that is available right now allow for this to be secure. Like, for instance, I know about the case, I think it was in Sweden that the data was given to the, uh, a lot of data, health, but also financial data were given to the researchers to do some kind of uh, microanalysis that was, at least by itself, very valuable. But I don't believe that um, uh, this data can be safe. And uh, mm -hmm. I know that, that this is, you know, maybe not on the individual level, it's not that important because uh, it's unlikely that uh, a particular individual will be targeted. We are talking more about bucketing, uh, I mean, putting people in the buckets and, you know, targeting uh, uh, marketing and things like that. Um, but the more, um, the more these data are accessible, the more likely it becomes that you actually might target someone. Um, in terms of, you know, stealing the identity and many, many other things. Um, so, and, uh, you know, eventually someone will, uh, will exploit that. And, uh, you know, it, we have to be careful about not to be, you know, a random victim of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a fair point to make. Um, I'm always interested uh, in also the underlying reasons. So, uh, breaches and uh, security risks, uh, I get that's always, that is a good reason, for example, but I'm also always interested in uh, what do we fear behind those security breaches? Like, what is, like, what are the consequences of a security breach that we actually fear? Um, so that's interesting. Um, but then again, like, the sharing of uh, health data doesn't have to be patient level data, right? So it can be uh, aggregated outcome results, for example to show the effectivity of a treatment. That's something that can be shared without, with at least um, less of the risk than the patient level data itself. So even though we may not be able to now or in the foreseeable future already uh, share patient level data, uh, it may be worth to look into sharing data on a, yeah, on a less, uh, on a less risky level. So maybe on aggregated outcome level. Okay, Sorry, did you. did you want to add something? No, I just, just wanted to say thank you for the, for the question, okay. for the reply. And uh, actually, the research that I was, do, I was mentioning, they shared the individual data that well, you were able to identify the person. But okay, this is a close parenthesis. <laughs> and thank you for your reply. Yes, no, no worries. Um, I also see that uh, Bangin Brim has a question. Um, yes. Yeah, sure. Ask away. Let's let me try to turn on the video if possible. Yeah, you can see it. Perfect. Yes, Ismail, thank you so much um, for your introductory talk, and thanks also for the data sharing session to host. Um, I surely wanted to ask you regarding the data volume generated through health data, of course, and also regarding when we have to share the data. I mean, we can have them centralized, we can have them decentralized. We have it right now infrastructure when we talk about 5G, but also 6G is also in planning. Do you have any considerations regarding that, regarding the European infrastructure right now? Are we ready? What has to be done? What kind of further obstacles do you see here? Are you uh, speaking of data sharing like on a European level, like between member states? For example, exactly. For example. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's why I, cannot, I don't have a clear answer on, I think. Um, but then again, I, I think like before we even think about sharing data between member states, which uh, will have value, I think. Um, the value you already can have within a healthcare system to share data, um, and not necessarily between healthcare systems, that's something that's already relevant to be explored, I think. Um, but on the consequences or impact of 5G or maybe even 6G on this process, that's something I cannot uh, delve into deep on. Okay, so thank you. Okay, great. Um, then I do have some questions left. Um, thank you for the input. Uh, I think we touched upon many different topics. And um, while well, you talk about a lot of benefits, uh, and we also 
hear a lot of barriers in terms of volume and uh, privacy. Um, do you think that we can expect some changes anytime soon or um, is that really more of a long-term change we can expect? Um, changes regarding regarding what precisely? Uh, regarding uh, data sharing and change, changing in the way that it is right now, that every institution has their own data patient database. Uh, maybe we can expect some nationwide data sharing or small steps in this. Do you think we can expect that? Yeah, I think uh, on the technological side, um, a few things have to be done first. So you have to like you have to redesign the whole architecture. That's something that would take some time. Uh, that's something that you cannot do as one single institution. That's something you have to do collectively and there has to be some buy-in, at least from a governmental level. Um, on when to expect such changes, that's something that is not in my court. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, does, does that answer uh, your question? Yeah, sure, in a way. There are just many barriers, I guess, and uh, we collectively need to decide on how to proceed from here. Um, and as you said, a lot of technological knowledge is necessary in order to create this whole new infrastructure in which data sharing would be the new standard. Um, do you think that a lot of third parties in this should be involved? And um, does that create whole new barriers in terms of security or financial funding uh, barriers? Do you think it's possible to create the technological infrastructure to create European-wide data sharing? Um, I think if it's possible, it's something that has to be done collectively by a lot of different parties. So like I said, don't, you, you cannot expect like medical institutions on themselves to create such an ecosystem. Uh, so you need buy-in at least from the medical institutions themselves, from the patients who, are, who have ownership of the data, uh, but also from the governmental bodies. Um, and in addition, you need to have support probably from the technical parties. So while we are having this discussion, uh, you already see that some questions pop up on the technical side, uh, which we already can have some discourse on, but probably not have the definite answers on. So you'll have to fly in some expertise when shaping this. Um, and I think that's also the challenge, like how do you actually connect everyone and get everyone uh, facing the same direction when trying to shape a system like this. Um, but I do think that it starts with showing people the value of even participating in the sharing of data and then taking away the caution and reservations that they may have towards sharing the data. Okay, thanks. Gives hope, I think. Um, I see that someone asked a question in the chat group. Um, do you want to ask it yourself? I could just read out loud the question. It's related to artificial intelligence. Um, here it comes. Uh, there are many health research projects with artificial intelligence involving personal data. Do we have enough safeguards to protect personal data when artificial intelligence is involved? Um, yeah. I cannot answer this specifically for health, but I think a lot of artificial projects, uh, artificial intelligence projects in the past have shown us that there is a lot of area to be covered uh, regarding how we use artificial intelligence and how we uh, how we perceive it. So things regarding uh, data ethics, things regarding uh, what do we do with the outcomes, uh, things regarding how do we deal with the lack of transparency with AI projects. So I definitely think that there is like a lot of area to be covered. Uh, there have been some mishaps uh, within like very large technological players like Amazon, like Microsoft. So, um, it is something to look out for. It is something definitely uh, to keep in mind. But then again, artificial intelligence is um, it's a use case for when you have the data. Um, but even just simpler uh, analytics, like descriptive analytics can show a lot of insight into, uh, into how a health system is performing. Thank you for that information. I hope it answers the question. Um, to the one who raised it. Um, yes, Laura, thanks for asking what are the thoughts on the answer. I hope it answers. Mm -hmm. I think we touched upon... And on this a little bit. 
Because this answer, I think, is incomplete. In my understanding, artificial intelligence could be like decision maker, you know, in some cases in health as well, but in other fields also. And if artificial intelligence operates the data, and including sharing also, you should be sure that this data will be not revealed to someone. For instance, for Microsoft, I don't know, owners of these applications, for instance. There are many questions about this now ongoing, so we should have something more, let's say, sure for this. Something more uh, really proven that is protected, that data are protected. Unless, because you have now a lot of EU projects concerning health and artificial intelligence. And if you will have applications, you know, involved in diagnostics, treatments, and so on, and involving like a partner artificial intelligence for decision making in clinical decision making together with physicians and patients in a way, you should be sure that these data are protected. If not, then you should stop this probably. This is ethical question, very important one. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I agree. I think it's definitely an important question. Um, not even just having safeguards, but also having uh, an accountability management structure. So if something goes wrong or who is actually accountable for it? Like, is it the partner uh, company that was flew in to create the algorithm or is it the medical institution themselves? So I think this is an area which is really new um, and in which we have like a lot of steps to explore yet. I, in your article, you also mentioned that there was a consultation which stated that most of the, the people that were asked were uh, agreeing that it would be beneficial to share data in terms of uh, improvement in treatment and diagnosis. Um, so that means that there are people actually willing to share the data and to help with this process. Do you think that the mindset of the people could help here? Yeah, definitely. So I think uh, this is all like the same consultation also showed some reservations regarding like uh, some of the topics we discussed today. So privacy, security breaches, data protection. Um, the same uh, consultation showed some reservation regarding those topics as well. Um, however, uh, the outlook on the benefits were largely positive. So like you stated, like uh, I think around 80% of respondents agreed that the sharing of health data could be beneficial to improve treatment, diagnosis, and prevention of diseases. Um, and I think that is really important because it is only when we agree on what direction we want to take, like do we actually want to uh, harvest the data better, do we actually want to leverage the data better and make it more available, um, then you can think about tackling all barriers when doing so. Then you can think about, okay, what do we have to do to safeguard the data? What do we have to do on a technological architecture uh, standpoint? Um, but it, you can only start thinking about these things once you have agreed that people actually want it. So I think the, the public outlook being positive is really important. And also the European Commission um, imperative to better leverage data is important. Because now we are put in a position that we uh, agree that we should think about all these barriers and how to actually tackle them in the coming years uh, and hopefully in the foreseeable future. Oh, I agree. It's, it's a good start, I guess. Um, okay, so I think we're slightly running out of time. Um, is there anyone still with questions? Because there's still room to ask away. I, I, have, I have three small questions. Uh, uh, to security. <laughs> Uh, auto security and can be answered fast, I think. Uh, first is uh, to the acceptance of the people. Do you think it's better to have opt in or opt out in the system? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, first uh, question, uh, then I, I, I give you the second and the third as well. Uh, okay. When it comes to uh, the storage of the data, do you think blockchain can be a solution? Okay. And third question, uh, how about micro clouds? If I don't use a data center at, in a big data center, but uh, when I store the data in, uh, let's say we have in Austria 9 million people and 9 million uh, micro clouds. All right, so uh, let's start with the first question then. So whether it should be opt-in or opt-out. I think that's definitely a good question. Um, a very relevant one as well. Um, so I'm not uh, black or white regarding opt-in or opt-out. I'm a bit in the gray area, but I do think that um, 
considering that for you to actually uh, decide to opt out for this, um, it requires quite some data literacy. Quite, it requires quite some technological literacy. So I think unless we can ensure that everyone understands uh, understands the opt-in slash opt-out clause, it should definitely be opt-in. So you should make the decision uh, knowing that you want to do it. Um, I do not think we're at the level yet that the yeah data literacy uh, in our society is that high that everyone knows exactly what the opt-in or opt-out clause would entail. So just from a protection standpoint, I would rather have people to opt in if they want to and if they are sure they want to, rather than them having to opt out. Okay, um, then there's the second question, so blockchain. Blockchain is by no means my expertise. Um, I think maybe Gianfranco can, uh, can answer this question uh, a bit better. So if you want to join Gianfranco. So the... Hi, uh, my name is uh, Gianfranco Cicconi. I, I also work for Capgemini Invent. I'm a colleague of Ismail, and I'm also involved in the project to some degree. Uh, the in terms of, of, of blockchain, um, my I also have um, I'm a blockchain developer certified, so I had the opportunity to test how we can use those elements. I I believe I share the let's say the pessimism of some of us in this call, that is that the, the technology has been probably hyped a bit too much. I, I had the opportunity to see it used appropriately to preserve confidentiality and privacy, but definitely it's not the, the solution to all evil in this case. Uh, I believe uh, that we may not need it, particularly because we are in a relatively uh, low abiding part of, of the world. So the, I would invest more in legislation and enforcement than the technology. Uh, I, if, if the one of, uh, in the audience who know me already, uh, you, besides being a technologist, I always say technology is the least of the problems. Uh, when we share whatever the platform, uh, we need to be sure that someone is going to know what legislation applies. And if something goes wrong, we have some door to knock at. Uh, personal data becomes a worse problem in this case because there is no way to take it back. So I join the, let's say the um, skepticism of many of us. At the same time, I would like to end on, on a note of positive from my side, that is I still believe that technology is valuable uh, as a user and as a developer, uh, but it needs to be considered in the context of everything else. So what is the legislation we can move within? What, what is the implementation of those legislation across the countries? And then we decide how to use blockchain the best way possible, like many other of the emerging technologies we have today, including uh, modern ways of encryption or potentially uh, quantum that, that some of us is already working on trying to understand what degree we need to protect ourselves from. That would be my five cents. All right. Uh, and then the last question to microclouds, right? Uh, which is another uh, question regarding how we shape a data sharing platform rather than uh, um, why we should do it. Um, yeah, regarding microclouds, I do not think uh, uh, it's something that falls within my expertise necessarily. Um, I've been thinking about, uh, so when, when it comes to like actually sharing the data, like you could organize it through the institutions, having them share the data of patients, but you could also think about having the patient still uh, own his data and independently trying to share his data. So, he retains ownership and he retains uh, full involvement in the data sharing process. And that is something in which a micro cloud could be an option. Uh, but beyond that, um, I think how you actually shape the data sharing process, that is something that requires a lot of thorough exploration. That's not something that we'll probably uh, know how to do uh, today or, uh, or tomorrow. That will take some time and exploration, definitely. Do you know the Austrian system as we use it already? And, at, and that is, is installed, uh, it's called ELGA. This is the Electronic Health Act. And uh, the data is stored at the doctors and the owner of the data is the patient. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay, that sounds interesting. Okay, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll definitely have a look at that then. That, uh, that sounds promising. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for the questions and thanks for the input. I want to thank you all. I want, uh, first of all, thank you, Ishmael, for your time and uh, your insights on the matter. Um, uh, thank, uh, thank, thank you all for, for joining this discussion. Uh, I think the interaction was really nice. And um, there's still a, discussion, a slight discussion going on in the chat. Um, so, yeah, I think that proves that this is a really difficult matter. It has a lot of benefits and a lot of barriers, which we definitely need to discuss a little more before uh, really implementing data sharing in the healthcare sector. Um, so, yeah, great to, to, to open up this discussion. And uh, if you're interested, this, this session was obviously recorded and will be online next week. And for now, uh, have a nice day. and. Uh, Hope to see you in our next session.